Everybody get your name tags out. If you don't have one, make one. And if you don't mind, you, can you all come ahead so people who come in later can sit at the back, or at least I don't have to work so hard yelling at you. So please move up front and let me begin, right? Uh, this is going to be the last in our series of lectures on comrades. Come on up front. Okay. So here's what we're going to, going to do today. We're just going through a quick recap of Backprop through a CNN. Specifically, we're going to cover the bits that we did not cover in the previous class. And we're going to look at some modifications of CNNs uh, and some, some extra problems that the basic CNN formalism wasn't originally designed to handle, and some success stories. So here's the story that we've seen so far. Shift invariant pattern classification tasks like, does this picture contain a flower, can be uh, uh, performed by scanning for the target pattern, scanning for the flower in the input. And this uh, operation of scanning and voting over the scan is, can, be, can be reformulated by reorganizing the computations. And when you reorganize the computations such that the scanning happens element by element, we got a convolutional neural network. Now, many of you got confused due in the, over the uh, break and also when you were dealing with your quiz and your homework about the difference between one-dimensional scans and two-dimensional scans. If I have a sequence of vectors, where I can expect the pattern to happen anywhere, like when I'm looking at a voice recording and I'm looking for the word hello, then I would be scanning only left to right, but each input is still a vector. So the filters that you would see would still be rectangular, except they're scanning only left to right, and they're going to be spanning the entire height of the picture. If you've got a 2D image, so, so when we did that, we called that a time delay neural network or a 1D CNN. If you've got a picture, a two-dimensional two picture, you did a proper scan, we call that a 2D CNN or just a CNN. Now, all of these are shared parameter networks that can be trained using variations of backdrop. We've already seen this. So here's how we uh, cast backpropagation. You would have training instances where uh, you were given the input and a label. So for each instance, you just first propagate it through the network. Then you could backpropagate. You'd, you'd get an output, which was the class uh, prediction that the network makes. You could compare this to the true label for the class and back propagate the error from the end back into the network. Now, the initial back propagation is going to happen through the final decision layers, which, is, which could either be a complete MLP or just a simple soft max or a max, uh, which is more commonly used these days. And then once you got past here, you had to make some modifications to figure out how to back propagate the, the gradients you got at this point back through the net. And so there were two distinct problems to deal with. The first is how do, we, how do you back propagate through convolutional layers? Now in each convolutional layer, there were two operations. The first was the creation of the affine maps that was generated by scanning the input with filters. And the second, was the computation of the activation map, which was obtained by an element-by-element -element application of an activation function on the affine map. So when you go back, both have to be reversed. So for the convolutional layers, the, we have two steps. Given the deriv derivatives for the, the output activation map, we had to figure out how to compute the derivatives for the affine maps, keeping in mind that the relationship between the two is element-element-wise. And then second, given the derivatives for these affine maps, ZL, we had to figure out how to go back and compute the derivatives all the way to the output maps of the previous layer, as well as the filters that connected the two. Now, now a CNN has both con layers and pooling layers. So for pooling layers, we had to, we had to figure out how to compute the derivative for the input 
maps given the output pool maps, right? Now, this portion we already did in the last class, so we're going to focus on the pooling layers in this class. Now, here's how we cast pooling. Pooling is introduced for jitter invariance. You want to be able to get a robust output even if the input patterns move around a little bit because you're looking for structured patterns in the input. And so what we would be, the, what the pooling operation does is to look at a collection of elements and perform some kind of operation that, it, that we assume will introduce jitter invariance and capture a pattern. Now you're, not, now you're not trying to find a pattern that occurs over the entire range. It's more like, you know, this is a smaller version of trying to look for a flower in the picture this is like, does, this, this answers the question, does whatever pattern I'm looking for happen in this small window? That's what pooling did. And clearly, when you do this, if you're looking for a pattern in a small window and you want to slide forward, it makes sense to hop all the way out front and not be sliding element by element because you're looking for jitter invariance. You're looking for uh, local patterns. And so typically, pooling would be done with strides greater than one. That doesn't mean that pooling windows will not overlap. They could overlap, but the stride is typically greater than one. And the resulting output is going to be downsampled. It's going to be smaller than the input map itself. So here's what the pooling operation would look like. There are different kinds of pooling operations that we saw. We could perform max pooling. We could perform mean pooling. We could perform other kinds of pooling operations in between. So if you were performing max pooling and if you were performing max pooling over these four elements, so let's say those four elements are one, three, six, and five, then there's a two-step process. In the first step, you find out the location of the element that has the maximum value. So here the maximum value is six, and the location is given, you know, is captured for that window. In the second step, you read the element for the, of the max location into the output map, right? So this element here, is going to be six, which has been computed from all four of these elements. So uh, when you're going backwards now, if I'm looking at the elements, if I'm, if I'm computing the output six from all four of these elements, how many of these elements are actually contributing to the output? Thank you, right? So how many elements will actually obtain a derivative? Thank you, <laughs> right? Beautiful, I like that. So here's what happens. When you take a max, just one element goes in. So the derivative, when you come back, only applies to that one location because varying the remaining elements will not change the output. Again, anytime you speak of a derivative, you have to ask yourself the question, you know, what does it mean? And the derivative for any value is gives you some indication of how much the output of the function changes if that particular value is perturbed. And these guys clearly perturbing them is not going to make any difference whatsoever to the output. So these will get a zero, right? So here's what the max pooling operation would look like going forward. When you're going forward, you sort of this is this is within one layer. And you're going map by map or channel by channel, if that's the word you like to use. So you're going to be applying max pooling individually to each channel. And within each channel, you're striding forward. And at each location, you pull out a little square window of the input, find the largest value, in the index of the largest value, and then copy the, the uh, channel value at that index into the output. So this was the max pooling, right? Going backwards, here's, here's something that, ha here's what we do, we just we initialize all derivatives to zero. Now, if the input was, say, this sized, let's, in our example, let's say, four cross four, and the output was two cross two, if I go backwards, when I'm computing my derivatives backwards, at this point, I'm going to have a two cross two derivative. If I take a step back, what will the size of the derivatives be, the map of derivatives be? Is it on? Four by four. four by four. It's going to be the entire input, right? 
everything that's used to compute the output is going to get a derivative. They may not be non-zero, but it's going to be the whole thing. And so we initialize this entire thing to zero. And then for each element, you're going to copy that derivative into the location that it came from. But observe something over here. In my pseudocode, I actually have this as plus equals, right? Why would it be plus equals? Anyone want to tell me? Okay. Absolutely, right? So if I have something like this, let's say five by five, and if I decide to perform a max pooling over say three by three windows, then this the first element of the output might get some the max out from this block. The next element is going to get the max from this block. And in both cases, the max might be this one term, right? So now going out, this max is going to contribute to two positions at the output. And so when you're going backwards, both of them will contribute to the derivative of the, at that position. That's why you have a plus equal to, right? So questions? This is easy, nothing fancy, right? The other operation we could perform was mean pooling. When we were performing mean pooling, again, this is all about jitter invariance, right? So you can say, I'm going to take the average of all of these guys, and that's going to give me an indica indication of whether the pattern I'm looking for is present in this little window or not. And so the value you'd copy over here is just going to be the average of all of these four elements. Now, in this case, do all four elements contribute to the output? OK, can you say that as loudly as before? Yeah. OK, thank you. The derivative over here, to which of these elements is, going, is it going to contribute going backwards? How much? In equal proportions, right? So basically, this derivative is going to be, in this case, it's a, a quarter of that derivative is going to end up in each of the four locations. And so in general, if this is a k cross k window, the, what happened? This is going to be one over k squared of the derivative that keeps, that keeps getting allocated backwards. And so if I were looking at the uh, pseudocode for mean pooling, now mean pooling, the, the uh, code for mean pooling actually ends up being simpler than the code for max pooling because when we were performing max pooling, we first had to pull up the location, the index, store it, and then read the value of that index. Whereas here, I can just compute the mean, and, uh, and that can be done in one shot. So the code is simpler. But then going backwards, here's what you have. The derivative, this should have been a dy. I have a bug. That derivative simply gets distributed over all of the elements e equally, over all of the elements in the input window, right? So the support. Okay, 10 seconds, guys. Yes. Pardon me? The one over k squared term, that's easy, right? If you go over here, this is a k cross k window. So, so that mean is one over k squared, right? Okay, let, let me continue. Both of these statements were true, obviously. We just went over them, so, okay. Now, so what we've done is we've shown the derivative of the divergence with respect to every intermediate output and every parameter by this point. So 
now we that, now that you've computed these derivatives, you can just plug them into a uh, gradient descent, and you're good to go. Yes, Prithvi. Yeah. Um, what happens if you have two measures that do not come the same value? So that's actually described in the slides, right? And we have uh, discussed this earlier uh, on Piazza. The question you're asking is. Uh, does changing any, perturbing any of these guys perturb the output? How much does it perturb it by? So the, uh, the actual answer is a little more complex than that, in that when you're speaking of perturbations, you have to worry about the direction of perturbation, right? So the, instead of, let's say x1, I have just, looking at just a, a max of two elements, x1 and x2, then it's the same as looking at x1 minus x2, and say checking whether this is positive or negative, right? And so this is like your ReLU, meaning if you're only picking the max, uh, this is very similar to looking at a ReLU. If this is positive, you're going here. If it's, if it's, if it's negative, you're gonna get an output of zero. So what this means, so let, let's go back to the case of x1 and x2, right? I have x1, I have x2, and x1 equals x2. If I perturb x1, in the negative direction, will it change the output? No. Right? If I perturb it in the positive direction, it does. So is it true for me to say that the derivative is one for x1? You cannot say, right? Because it depends on the direction of perturbation. So same thing for x2, right? So in this, in this case, so even if x1 were unique, the direction of perturbation really matters, right? So although I've just happily told you that the derivative is one, the truth is it really, you, you know, I was kind of being casual when I spoke about it. The way to think about it as is the derivative is as the slope of the line that just touches the curve, right? And I can swing this curve from here all the way up to here, and at each of these positions is actually touching this curve. And I can think of that sharp angle as a curve, you know, that if you keep zooming in, eventually you're gonna get a point where it sort of curves up, right? And so I could choose any number between zero and one as my derivative at this point. We are just choosing one because, you know, we want the updates to be as fast as possible. But if you think of it as, you know, how much does the output change if the input changes a little bit, the answer is this depends on the direction in which you're gonna change the input. And so depending on the direction, you can get different answers. And so if I have two elements, if I have just one element which is maximum, say x1, the derivative can be any value between zero and one, and if you choose any of these, I cannot fault you for it. You would choose a one because it's going to give you the fastest updates. If I have two elements, x1 and x2, which are both the same, the derivative is going to be somewhere in the range between 0, 0, and 1, 1. Any vector between these two is going to be a valid derivative. Typically, you choose the fastest one. Is that making a sense to everybody? Can you raise your hands if it is, right? Because this is a question that keeps coming up. That when you speak of derivatives, why, why are you know, these corners, why don't corners have a clear uh, derivative because at corners, the direction in which you perturb things changes the answer about how much the output changes, right? And so you can get a range of values, all of which will be right. Anyway, so the story so far, the convolutional neural network is a supervised version of a computational model of mammalian vision. It includes convolutional layers comprising learned filters that scan the outputs of the previous layer and downsampling layers that operate over groups of inputs from the convolutional layer to reduce network size. And the parameters of the network can be learned through regular backpropagation. So max pooling layers, in this case, propagate derivatives only over the maximum element, whereas other pooling operators might distribute the derivatives. And derivatives must always sum over appropriate sets of elements to account for the fact that the network is, in fact, a shared parameter network. This is what we have seen so far. Questions? No. Anything on Piazza? No. Okay. 
So moving on, in all of the discussion that we've had so far, we have assumed that when you take a step forward, when we convolve, the size of the convolution output either stays the same or shrinks, right? So for example, ignoring boundary effects, we said if I had a two-dimensional two convolution and if I scanned it with a filter, when I scanned it, the output was going to be basically, you know, again, I'm ignoring the boundaries. What happens to the boundaries? Again, if the stride was one, the output was the same size as the input, except that maybe you lost a boundary layer and a column and a boundary uh, row. Or if you had a one-dimensional input, so a collection of vectors, and if you scanned it with a filters of this kind, going left to right, if you had a stride of one, the output was the same length as the input, except for something that you might lose at the boundary, right? What was the alternative? You could take a stride or that was greater than one. And if you took a stride that was greater than one, then in this case, you'd maybe go here, then go here, then go here, then go here, and now the output is going to be two cross two, right? Similarly, you could be jumping and the output would be smaller. So the implicit assumption has always been that every step of the operation is going to either retain the size or it's going to shrink the size. But suppose I wanted to increase the size, how would I do this? So to ask this question, right, I'm showing you the equivalent of a 1D scan over here. Again, you can generalize this to 2D scans, right? Typically, each bar, this is obviously a distributed parameter network. This is a CNN. And can you tell me what is the, how many filters in the first layer and what is the stride, anyone? Jessica, what, how many filters in the first layer and what is the stride? Two, what is it, and the stride, stride is also two, right? What about the second layer? How many filters? Three, and the stride? Also three, right? And the third layer? Two and three, right? So what happens over here? Now when I'm striding forward, I can associate time with every column. So this guy represents some time which is somewhere between these two elements because it's covering those two elements, correct? And this guy, so this guy represents something between these two elements as you keep starting forward. Similarly, these vertical bars, they represent some time between these six elements that they span, each of these. So the bars actually have a notion of time going forward. But what do we observe over here? That as I go up the layers, the number of bars reduces. So the amount of time spanned by each bar keeps increasing, right? But now suppose I wanted to do something like this. I've got into this position where now I have one bar for every six inputs, but then at the next level, I want one bar for every two inputs. Can I do this from the information I have? So let's ask this question again, right? I have, this is time, and these are my ticks. And let's say at this position, I've got one bar here, and then one bar here. So I have got a stuff computed. Actually, let's do this, right? Is it every three? Okay, right? And now at the next position, I want one at every time instant. And furthermore, I, you know, it's not enough to say I want bars, right? When you suggest, when you give kernels, when you give filters of this kind, what else do you have to specify? Kunal, what else do you have to specify? The, the stride? No, this, the, when I, when I, when I, that already has given you the stride, right? 
Pardon me? There's more. There's something missing. The width, right? I have to tell you exactly how much of the input this guy is going to be looking at. Otherwise, I can't compute this filter, right? Now, do I have all the information necessary to compute this guy? What's missing? Maxwell, what's missing? This guy is missing, correct? This guy is missing. This guy is present. This guy can compute this, but it's missing this one. It's missing this one, right? These are all missing. Similarly, this guy has got one, but the next one is missing. So the reason I cannot have more elements at the next layer than the current layer is because I have bars missing, right? So given this, how would you solve this? Beautiful, okay, so I can sort of, although I didn't explicitly compute these guys, I can take a guess, right? What would be the cheapest guess? That average is actually a pretty good guess. That's a nice thing, right? But something even simpler. Pardon me? I can just fill them with zeros, can I not? You're getting too fancy. But the answer is the closest one doesn't give you any extra detail, right? But the averages, if you just sort of did a linearly interpolated, you probably do a better job. There are better ways of filling in those regions. But if you want to be lazy, fill them with zeros. And so these, these guys, if I want to, in order to compute all the black bars, you can see the orphaned inputs, which are missing. And those are the guys that I'd like to have. I need to compute them somehow. And there are different ways of filling them in. Computationally, the cheapest thing you can do is I'm not going to bother with this. I'll just fill them with zeros. Right? Everybody with me so far? Yeah. OK. So if I fill them with zeros, then let's go back and look at the bars above here. How many inputs is, say, this bar actually getting? So going back here, how many real inputs is this bar getting? One. Just one. The rest. So this is what you actually have, right? By the way, this is you know, analogous to upsampling when we were going backwards, when we were computing derivatives. If you, when you, if you downsample going backwards when you computed the derivatives, you filled out the map with zeros and then computed derivatives backwards, right? So this is basically the same trick except going forward. And now, if you just say that many of these guys are not really contributing anything, I can get rid of them. And this is the compute computation that you'd actually be performing. Right? Everyone clear about this? Right. This computation derives from the fact that I chose to fill the intermediate values with zeros. If you fill them with something other than zeros, which is probably a more reasonable thing to do under some, you know, uh, arithmetically speaking, then uh, you couldn't just ignore the uh, black bars. So one of the outcomes of doing this is every vertical bar in that pink band over here, identical to every other bar in terms of parameters. Are they all identical in terms of parameters? Can someone tell me? Are they? How many inputs is this guy getting? How many? Look at this guy. So this one here. This one, how many is it getting? How many incoming arrows? Two, right? Uh, what about this one here? How many incoming arrows? One. There are actually three distinct types of bars over here as you can see, right? So the ones in blue are looking at something immediately to the right and something two steps to the left. The, some, the ones in green are looking at something 
immediately to the left and two steps to the right. The ones in red are looking at only one position, right? They're all getting different patterns of inputs. Their parameters would not be identical, would they? No, they're going to have, you have three distinct, depending on the arrangement, depending on how much you are increasing the size by, if you're increasing the stride in a size by a factor S, you're going to get S distinct sets of parameters. Yes, Ron? No, because what happened is, if you look at the black bar, so if I introduce the bars, right, the connection of the weights to this guy is different from the connection of the weights to the one, two out, right? Yeah, but the inputters are in the same, in the same spot for that, right? So, I'm not sure if I get, I get your answer, but let me try to explain what I thought you asked, right? So, I have these guys, and these are empty. So something over here is looking here and out here. And let's say at these, right? These are five different sets of weights, if you, if you consider the zeros. Something over here is looking at these, right? So this weight is not the same as this weight, yeah. which is why those If you, if, you, if you viewed it in this manner. Yeah, but you'll just input what you have here. So is there the same five weights over time? So every one of these vertical guys is going to have the same set of weights, right? So every one of the reds is going to have the same set of weights. It's always looking down. So you have the same weights, it just happens to be zero instead of a zero zero. So it's the same weights, but it's, it's zero. the effective number of parameters, right? Those are forced to zero you're not going to be using them. You could put in other numbers, but the, you, know, you, you can't really be using those guys, right? I mean, you're subsampling the parameters from this one. So if you wanted to think of each of these as having five different sets of weights going down, then they would be identical. But then most of them are not being used for most of them, right? So the number of effective parameters that you've got the red ones have one set of parameters which are not used by the remaining ones. The blue ones have a different set of parameters, some of which are not used by the remaining ones. Making sense? Right? So the effective parameters are different. There's a point. The student cannot see the pointer. I think it's because the envelope is too small. I need my sword. Sean, can you get my sword? My office is open. Pardon me? I want the plastic sword. It's on my table. I forgot, I forgot to bring my sword today. And there's also a question about what upsampling is for in the future. So we will get to that later. Right. Okay, five seconds, guys. Let's go on, right? The first one is true, but then. Here's what I want, you to, I want you to observe in this figure. This is something that was there in the quiz, in the poll, but I didn't make explicit. When I have uniform striding over here, where the, out, where the size of the layer is the same, uh, or same as the layer underneath or smaller, then the, number, then the pattern of weights going into each column is identical, right? going into each column is identical. Whereas out here, the pattern of weights 
coming into each column is not identical. If I'm striding by S, I have S distinct sets of non-zero weights, right? What is identical over here? The pattern of outgoing weights from the lower layer is identical for every column. Making sense, right? So at the upsampling layer, the behavior sort of flips around. Then the our pattern of outgoing weights from the lower column remains identical. So when you actually perform the computation, things will kind of change. Now, here's an example of a network with one upsampling layer. There's a question on Piazza. How does, uh, uh, why does upsampling help? Is this a scanning MLP at this point, once I begin upsampling? Yes or no? How many think yes? Raise your hands. How many thinks no? Think no, right. And some of the rest of you, those who are on the wall, they're kind of undecided. Everybody who raised your hand is wrong, right? Because this is the actual structure of the MLP now that's looking at the input. This is still a shared parameter network. I'm, being, I'm scanning the input with an MLP that's inside this yellow triangle as I go forward. Can you see that, right? What happened at the upsampling layer? At the upsampling layer, now typically if you look at the downsampling layer, all of these columns had shared parameters, right? So every column was identical to every other column. So also here, every column was identical to every other column. But when I got to this third column, I had a reduced set of reduced sharing. The three columns were no longer identical. Can you see what happened here, right? So if I want to sort of redo the sh parameter sharing such that at some level I no longer want to share parameters, I end up in this kind of scenario where this effectively looks like an upsampling layer. Is that making sense to everybody? Yes, yes you can. These guys are, and they're not the same, right? Because this has only one thing going in, right? In this particular case, they are the same, but if I were to look at something like, say, this one, then you can see that in this column, I have five, I have three distinct types of bars. Some are identical, right? So basically what would happen here is that you have two distinct sets of bars. So this, uh, this guy and this guy are going to be identical. This is going to be different. Um, can you say uh, the blue with two zero inputs are? Yeah, they are identical, right? So the per share, sharing of parameters changes even within a layer when you actually have upsampling layers. Okay? And as far as computation is concerned, this is fairly straightforward. For the 1D case, I can just go left to right. So as I'm scanning things from left, maybe I fill in, I can just fill in all of these guys with zeros. And then at some point I've uh, computed the values here. Then unlike the downsampling layer where I'm pulling information in from the lower layer, here I'm going to be pushing information out to the upper layer because that pushing out is always an identical operation in every case, right? So this guy is going to contribute to all three of these then I can move forward and this is going to contribute to the three that it's pushing out to with the same set of weights, except you know, if you look at this element, this got something from here and then whatever came from here got added to it. So it's always cumulative and you can scan left to right. So this is often called transposed convolution. Now why is it called transposed convolution? If you think of the weights out here, for this layer, you have a set of parameters, weights coming in, and that's a filter that's scanning the lower layer, right? Here, the uh, weights coming, uh, if, I, if I want to think of it as scanning, where am I actually applying the filter? I'm pushing things out, right? So I have to consider the arrangement of weights with respect to this layer rather than the layer that's actually getting the values. And so when I think of how in the, the weights with respect to this layer, then the weights matrix gets transposed. So typically the weights matrix is arranged as where each row indicates all of the inputs coming into a single element, right? 
But if I'm pushing out, now each row is going to represent all of the outputs that an element is pushing information out to. That's going to be a transpose. Are we making sense? Right? This is just terminology. Now, we saw how it, what it looks like in 2D, in 1D. Let's see what happens in 2D. It's still very similar. If I want to uh, perform convolution on this guy such that the output is larger, then what I would do is upsample the input maps, the channels, by introducing zeros, such that now the output, the upsampled channels maps are the same size as the output that I want. And now these guys, this arrangement of maps is what I'm going to be convolving the filter with to compute the output. It's the same thing that we just saw before with the 1D case, right? But you can also think of this in the, you know, in the, as the simpler operation. Why bother with filling things out with zeros and then performing the convolution? Let's take a shortcut. Let's keep it small, but then perform the operation such that the output is the same size as before. That, once again, is exactly the same as this operation, where I said we're going to be pushing information out, right, upwards. So here's what you would do. Now I'm going to create my output map of the size that I want it to be if it were scaled up. And now once again, because I'm, you know, because I'm pushing information out, these filters have to be transposed. So the filters are going to be basically transposed across their diagonals. And then here's how the operation would be performed. I'm going to be multiplying the filter by the first element of each of the corresponding input maps and then summing the lot up. And that will fill in this region of the output map. Now, if the output is sort of increasing by a factor of two, then the second element of all of these guys would multiply these filters. And then I sum the lot up. And in the output now, I stride forward by two and continue filling in the map. Making sense? Right? And then the third element of these guys is going to multiply all of these filter channels. And then you sum them up. Then I stride forward by two again and fill in the output. And wherever you have an overlap, that means you're summing the contributions from the, from the various filters, from the various positions. Is this, so this is how the computation would proceed all the way to the end. Did that make sense to everybody? Yes, you can. So this is, remember, these are the input channels, right? These are the input channels. These are the channels of the filter. So this channel of the filter is multiplied by the first element of the first map. This one is multiplied by the first element of the second map. And then you sum them all up. This is standard. This, this is how you always perform your convolution, right? This is identical to doing this. The only thing that changes is that you have to transpose each of these filters across the diagonal. That's all. Yes, Jeffrey? So wait, wait. So the input has only one channel. The number of channels in the output depends on the number of filters. Right? That's a different set. That's a different issue. Correct? OK. So I actually have the expanding convolution pseudocode. I'll skip that. But then, so we know, so has everybody understood how we upsample going forward. And also the fact that upsampling going forward basically, uh, it has a couple of different uses. One, of course, is if you're performing convolutional uh, uh, operations, there's no reason for you to, for you to say that all, all of the, uh, all of the uh, uh, filters or all of the columns within any, any, any particular row should have shared parameters. So you can change the parameter sharing. That's one. The second is, often you actually do want to increase the size of the output maps. And we'll encounter one of the reasons to do this in a few lectures. Yes. So over here, these guys, right, they would be, so if you compare this operation, where I'm just sort of multiplying one element at a time and then filling up things, 
with this implementation where I actually upsample the input and then scan with a regular filter. Then the filters in this case are going to be the trans diagonal transpose of filters in this case. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyway, there's another poll. Wait, back propagation, I didn't miss this, right? So now when I'm back propagating derivatives, if I back propagate derivatives from the upsampled map, I'm actually going to get derivatives for the upsampled input map, right? Because remember, effectively, what are we doing? You're going backwards, and when you were going forwards, you went from these maps, you upsample the input maps, and then you scan, you scan them to get the outputs. So when you go backwards, you're going to get, when you, when you propagate derivatives backwards using the techniques that we saw in the last class, you're going to get derivatives for this upsample map from which you would actually choose the elements that compose the original input map. And you downsample these things back to get the derivatives for the input maps. Does that make sense again to everybody? Right? So I have pseudocode. Go back, 65. I need a laser pointer with a thick beam. Ten seconds, guys. Okay, this was easy, right? Uh, both of these were both of these were true. So, if you've read them, now we aha. Thank you. This should help the guys on Piazza, right? So, what we in all of the in everything that we've seen so far, we were looking for shift invariance. What did we mean by shift invariance? Anyone want to tell me, James? What did we mean by shift invariance? Uh, like, if, so, like in this example, it doesn't matter the position of the flower. You didn't. You you wanted to find a flower regardless of the position of the flower. Does this also account for things like rotation of the flower? No. No. Okay. So going back to James, if I wanted to also account for the rotation of the flower, what would I do? So somebody else want to take a guess? Can you take a guess? Uh, so, so because like vector when you rotate, right? They're, they're going to be. You would probably need different rotation matrices in order to compute that. So here's what happens, right? Here's a way to think about it. When I was scanning for a flower, then I had this neuron. This, this, this filter, which was scanning effectively. It's a distributed parameter network, but it was a filter that was scanning for a uh, flower-shaped pattern in the input. So this filter had, just let me just make this flower asymmetric, had a filter of flower of this kind, right? Now suppose I also want to use the same filter to find rotated flowers. Then what would I do? Preksha. Pardon me? I can actually rotate the filter itself, correct? So in the first case, I'm going to scan with this filter. Then I'm going to rotate the filter, the, the pattern in the filter. And then I can scan for that. And that's going to give me the ability to detect both upright flowers and, and flowers that are rotated by how much ever I, I rotated, I rotated the filter bit by. Yes, 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 Raj. 
You could rotate the picture or the filter. They're both equivalent, right? You're right. They're equivalent, strictly equivalent. But hang on, we're not yet done. Right? So, Viraj is right. I could have rotated the input rather than the filters, and, and they're strictly the same thing, operation, right? So, here's what I would do. When I'm looking for a, uh, for a pattern in a shift invariant manner, I have some filter. I'm shifting the location of the filter and scanning the input uh, and reading the input, analyzing the input. That's what made the, sh the analysis shift invariant. I kept shifting the filter. If I also want to make it rotation invariant, say ro invariant to rotation by 45 degrees, then I will, in addition, rotate the filter by 45 degrees, like so, and then also use the rotated filter. So it's a rotated and shifted filter that I'm going to be using. So this gives me both rotation invariance and shift invariance. But then, does this particular operation give me rotation invariance to say 30 degrees? Because it's specialized to 45. So what would my solution be? Pardon me? I can try every possible rotation, right? So here's what I can do. So firstly, if I want to, uh, I can rotate, I can think of this as a generic transform. It need not just be rotation, right? If I go back to this figure over here, I had zoom, I had reflection. I have different operations that I might want the scanning to be invariant to. So what I could do is to have my filter be transformed in every possible way that I expect my pattern to be transformed to, and then scan with the transformed version of the filter. Is that making sense? Right? And so, here was your regular CNN, where you had, you were just, you had a filter, you were segmenting out the input and matching the input to the segment. Now, if I want to make it invariant to various kinds of transformations of the patterns, here's what I would do. At each position for each filter, I'm going to transform the filter in every possible way that I want it to be invariant to. And I'm going to be scanning with the transformed version of the filter. So what is the limitation over here? Does this, yeah. There are infinite five types of transforms. This is not going to account for every possible transform. How many transforms can, will, I, will it be accounting for? Just the ones I've enumerated, correct? And so here's what will really be happening. I'm going to be getting my original filter, but then the filter, I'm going to have some enumerated set of transforms, sorry. I'm going to have some enumerated set of transforms. So I might want to say, I want this to be invariant to 45 degrees. I want this to be invariant to a, a, a mirror imaging. I want this to be invariant to scaling by 1.2. So this would be the list of transforms that you would actually put in and perform your computation. Now, from each filter, how many output maps will you get? Earlier you were getting only one, right? Now you're going to get as many as there are transforms. So you can also see that this is simply going to blow up the number of intermediate variables. And as you go through the network, if each layer keeps doing, doing this, the whole thing is going to blow up pretty quickly. So although it's a very good idea, in practice, nobody would ever do it. I'm just introducing this as a, you know, it's something that has been proposed in the literature. And I'm introducing this because I've, we've, we've had this question in class. How do you deal with scaling? How do you deal with rotation? You don't, right? You're kind of hoping that whatever you're learning in the basic pattern learns it from your training data. If you want to deal with it explicitly, things will blow up. Now, as far as derivatives are concerned, now one common filter computed was transformed in many different ways, and all of them were used to compute the output, correct? So what, when you're computing derivatives, what would happen? I'm not sure why I have two pictures. I'm sure there was a story behind it. They are, Derivatives 
would flow backward and you'd get the derivatives for each of the transformed versions of the filter. Then you'd have to sort of untransform these transformed versions of the filter to accumulate the derivatives for the basic filter itself. Again, that's a complex operation, not something that I would recommend anybody tries, but it's, you know, conceptually that is what we'll be doing. So here's the story so far. The CNNs are shift invariant neural network models uh, for pattern shift for shift invariant pattern detection, which is their equivalent to scanning with shared parameter MLPs with distributed representations. The parameters of the network can be learned through regular backprop. We saw that. And like a regular MLP, individual layers may either increase or decrease the span of the representation learned. Remember, there was nothing in your MLP which said that layer three must have fewer neurons than layer two, right? So also over here, when you're scanning, the output can be larger or smaller depending on uh, how you design it. And the models can be easily modified to include invariance to other transforms, although these tend to be computationally kind of painful. But let's answer more questions. What about the exact location? Everything that we've done so far was started off with the question, does this picture have, the word, have a flower in it? Does this recording have the word hello in it? It's only asking questions about the presence or absence of a target pattern. It doesn't actually tell you where in the image or where in the recording the specific pattern happened, right? If you also want to detect the position of the object, then clearly you need more, uh, more outputs from the classifier. So here's what is typically done. You're going to make some assumptions. So if I know that my, flower, my image has a flower in it, just one. Remember, when you're asking the question, does this image have a flower, then you're not, you're not uh, making any assumption about the number of flowers in the image. So when you say, does this image have a flower, it could have 20 flowers, right? So if I assume that it has only one flower, then here is what else can be done. From the final output of the convolution, you can now have two distinct classifications of predictions being performed. The first one predicts the class itself. It's not just flower. Remember, these are multi-class classifications. So what kind of object is present in this image? And then the second one over here is going to tell you what are the corners, the bounding box, corners of the bounding box within which the image actually is actually present. So this is a very trivial extension to the basic idea itself. And now, when you want to train the network, you want to train the network not just to detect the presence of a flower, but also to learn the corners of the bounding box. So now you get two different losses. The first is the callback library loss divergence that you get from the classifier. For the second, you have the corners of the bounding box. So given the corners of the bounding box, there are different ways of defining a loss. Typically, you'd be, look, you'd be looking at the L2 loss for the corners, or you could be looking at an intersection over union or, or other kinds of losses that actually give you the accuracy with which the bounding box has been predicted. And so when we do the classification, so when we check if there is a flower in the image, you actually some kind of knowing the location of flower, isn't it? No, we don't, right? Because when you're saying, is there a flower, what we did was scan, and then we, did, we computed the, performed the, we uh, combined the predictions at all the positions. We were never specific about the location of the flower itself, right? Why not we use the same data and go to a, like a position go, of the image? The point is because once you begin getting a distributed representation, it's impossible. If you were just scanning with a fixed MLP without a distributed representation, then the MLP itself, you know, the specific locations at which the MLP peaks are where you're most likely to have the flower. But when you have a distributed representation, it's much more, much more challenging to localize. Right. Exactly, right? So you need an extra, that's a nice question. So you need this extra level of prediction, which actually looks at the outputs and tells you where the flower is likely to be. So you can use the same predictor. I don't know if our, most of you here haven't been at CMU long enough, but before the pandemic, if you walk down the corridor from, uh, from uh, Hillman to Newell Simon, right? 
from Gates to Newell Simon. They have a large screen out there, and as you walk down, it drew a skeleton on you. It was very scary. <laughs> uh, it looked like somebody had taken an X-ray. Now that's Yasser Sheikh's wonderful demo. He has the best technology for this. It literally draws the stick diagram, and it's remarkably accurate. Guess what? The technology, the way you do it, is exactly the same as this one over here. You're, you define a bunch of joints, one at one the toe, one at the ankle, one at the elbow, and so on. And from the final output, you would say, is there a person in this image? And if there is a person in this image, then you're going to also making the, uh, be looking at this error, uh, looking at the second predictor, which tells you where are the joints of this person. And then once you find the joints, you can just, just draw the stick image, right? Final poll. Question? For example, of, to find the bounding boxes, or rather like you gave the example of pose estimation, right? Doesn't like generating the training data become a very painstaking process? It does. This, uh, somebody, somebody should have actually drawn these things. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, so then would you try to use traditional computer vision techniques to uh, classical methods to actually like figure out these bounding boxes? Or so how you generate the training data is a different thing, right? There are many ways of doing it. And uh, it turns out that if you want to do the whole thing over here automatically, like finding the bounding boxes, there's, there's a whole class of techniques called learning from weak labels, et cetera. But that's not something. How those labels are obtained for training is something we won't be considering. Yet. Yes, that's a, that's a that's an entirely different problem. Okay, moving on, guys. Yeah. Pardon me. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting. I'm sorry, guys. Guys on piazza, I'm sorry. I should be using my sword, right? So. This one was true. Now there are very there are several variants of this basic framework that we just saw, like very deep networks with hundred or more layers in the MLP. So it turns out that when the the uh, the uh, network becomes very deep, then training is a problem. So ResNet is one which actually solves some of these problems. We'll see why we have this problem in a couple of classes from now. Uh, then you also have this business of depth-wise convolutions where instead of having multiple independent filters with independent parameters, you use common layer-wise weights and uh, combine the layers differently for each filter. So maybe we'll have some, uh, let, let me, uh, I'm not gonna be talking about res the, uh, the deep networks. Let's take a look at the depth-wise uh, convolution because once again, this is a conceptual idea, it's very neat. So consider how you, perform your standard convolutions. In your standard convolution, you have a bunch of different channels, or planes as I like to call them, or maps. And each channel is, is there a rope here? So the input itself has this structure where the, you, you have I could sort of organize all of my input channels as a cuboid. We saw this earlier, right? So this the input is going to have a bunch of different channels. And then when you perform the computation, when you convolve this with a filter, the filter too is going to have a number of planes or channels. And the way we perform the computation, the way we defined it, is that I place the filter at some location and of computed an inner product between the entire filter and the underlying region of the image. And then I moved on, right? I can change the order of operation. The way I would change the order of operation is I'm gonna just consider this first guy and I can convolve this first guy with the input, the first channel of the filter with the input uh, with the first channel of the input, I'm gonna get one plane, right? Then I can convolve the second channel of the filter with the second channel of the input, and I'm going to get a second plane. The third channel is going to convolve the third channel of the input, I get a third plane. So, and then finally, I just 
add all of these guys up, and this gives me a single map. Now, would doing, doing, doing things in this manner give me a different output than if, than if I did things in this manner? Would it? No, right? It's exactly the same operation. So, but then when you realize this, here's what happens. Suppose I have many different filters. Let's just imagine doing things in this manner. If I have many different filters, each filter is basically computing a collection of these maps, and then this collection of maps is being collapsed into a single map, one for every filter, correct? Now what is the weights, set of, what are the weights with which these things are being added? They're all one, I'm just sort of collapsing the lot. Now instead of having each filter produce a different set of maps, I can change things a little bit. I can say that I have one filter which just computes this collection of maps, right? And then instead of just adding them all with equal weights, I can add them with different sets of weights. And so depending on the set of weights, I'm going to get a different output map. That making sense, right? So I get, again, this is giving me as many output maps as this guy did, but obviously this has far fewer parameters. It's going to be maybe less expressive, but what you lose in terms of expressivity, you gain a lot, you gain, you gain uh, by orders of magnitude in terms of the number of parameters to see how so this is what we call a depth-wise convolution. And to see where the benefit comes from, consider this guy. If you have the conventional filters, if you have m input channels and n output channels, then you're gonna have, and say each filter is looking at a k cross k. Then you have m times n times, so, so each filter requires m times k cross k parameters. There are n of these filters. So you're going to need n times m times k squared parameters in the first case, right? In the second case, you just have one filter computing these, computing these uh, planes. So that's going to require just m times k squared parameters. And then for the actual output, these guys are combined with different weights. And for each of the output channels, I'm going to have one set of m weights. So the total number of parameters is nm times mk squared. And this difference in the number of parameters can end up being very large, number one. Number two, in terms of computation, this can be much, 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 much faster. Because if you look at this guy, I'm going to be performing as many convolutions as the number of filters that I have. Whereas here, this multi-channel convolution is just done once, afterwards it's just a simple addition, right? So both in terms of number of parameters and in terms of computation, this is gonna be much faster. Yes, Jeffrey? This case for the example of spreading more than one. So it's the same thing, right? So if this guy, regardless of whether you do it this way or this way, the stride is the, the, stride is the same issue, right? Meaning, meaning the first plane would be convolving the first, first uh, input map with a stride. So the, strides, uh, the stride is not really an issue. Again, look at this one. Over here, if I was striding by two, then I'd be placing this filter here, then I'd be shifting by two, and then placing the filter here and computing the next position, right? Which is the same as saying, I'm gonna take this first channel of the filter and stride by two when I compute this first channel here. Then the second channel of this filter is gonna be striding by two out here when I compute the second channel and so on. So there's the same operation. The stride is not, not a factor. Right. Yeah, Kunal? Pardon me?
Like what we're just saying is that each filter is like a scalar multiple of. Again, the weights are going to be different, so it's not really a scalar multiple, right? That's, that's exactly what we're doing. So this is like convolving at a one. This is a, like using one a level of distributed representations, and the rest of them are non-distributed. It's just a, right? So wouldn't you like, uh, have to switch away the power of each one and reduce the It does, because you have far fewer parameters to begin with, right? It does. The trade-off is speed and number of parameters that you have to estimate. So you need, need less training data. The thing is going to be faster. It converges better, and so on. Right, so adding to that, several variations of the basic model exist to obtain greater parameter efficiency, better ability to compute derivatives, and so on, right? Now, final thing, what do the filters actually learn? Now, when you have this distributed parameter network, these filters are looking, directly looking for, the first level filters are directly looking for patterns in the input, right? The second level filters are looking for patterns in the maps produced by the first level filters. And it's really hard to say what kind of patterns the second level filters are looking for. Because they could be looking for different, different combinations of uh, patterns in the first level filter inputs, right? And so the way you would have to do it, as you keep going higher up the network, it's really hard to predict what any one of these dots is looking for in the input. So, the way you would typically do it is to say, okay, I'm going to set this value to one. I'm going to back backpropagate the, uh, and I'm going to use backpropagation to estimate the input. That would give me a value of one out here. And then you could estimate the kind of patterns that the filter is looking for. And so the kind of patterns that each filter looks for in the input is what is called the filter's receptor field. And here's what we typically find. It turns out that these things actually end up doing a, uh, looking a whole lot like how the eye operates, looping back to three lectures ago. So when you train one of these CNNs on many, many different classes, it turns out that the lowest level filters simply begin end up looking for oriented lines in the input, which is much like what the biological eye does. And then at subsequent layers, depending on what you're looking for, so let's say you're performing multi-class classification, right? Then uh, I decide that I'm looking for faces. I tag the face output to one, the rest to zero, and I back propagate the uh, error. So I initialize the input anyhow, and then I back propagate the error to modify the input so that the output begins to say, you know, begins to uh, tries to match the, uh, the uh, modified input, gives you a label of a face. Then here's, uh, here are the patterns detected by the, the, an intermediate layer and the network. It actually ends up looking for parts of a face. As you go further up the network, it begins looking for different kinds of faces, right? Similarly, if you were looking at, uh, if, you, if the classifier were, were trying to predict cars, intermediate layers look for parts of cars. Higher level layers actually end up looking for complete cars. So this is, very similar to the kind of structure we assume the human brain itself has when it's analyzing visual images. So this one is for elephants. You can see that up top it looks for element, elephants, lower down it looks for parts of element, elephants and chairs and so on, right? Now, when you train these, you have standard convergence issues. Uh, so you have all the typical standard training tricks that we had for your NLP, they end up being applied here. Some problems are very specific to uh, CNNs. You will encounter these problems in your homework. You'll also find out the solutions. I won't give you the secrets, okay? Uh, now, one problem that you will run into frequently is insufficient training data because the network parameters, the network has to learn of a large diversity of inputs. Also, the number of parameters in the network can be very large. So. This is where we take advantage of shift invariance and uh, some level of jitter invariance. We augment our training data. You start off, st start off with your training data and synthesize training data by adding noise to the training data, by shifting patterns around, by rotating things a little bit maybe. And so here's, a, here's an example from one of the papers. I don't, don't remember which one. Uh, Krzyzewski's paper, I think. Here are some original data. These are augmented synthetic data that they generated from it. 
And now you can actually, given a small amount of training data, you can generate large amounts of these synthetic data that you would actually train your network with. And it turns out that when you do so, the network ends up being far more accurate. So just kind of wrapping up last six minutes, CNNs, they are one of the most frequently used formalisms in neural networks today. They're used everywhere, not just for image classification. Uh, they're used in speech and audio processing, processing, which are time series data. They're even used for processing text. And we'll see in the next class why that makes sense, right? So uh, Andre Karpathy, I don't know if he still has them. He has a very nice visual example on this web page where you can play around with parameters and see uh, how these things, uh, how the different parts of the network behave. So in the last few minutes, I'm sort of going to go over uh, the, uh, some of the successes of CNNs. If you went back only like seven or eight years, nobody really was using CNNs. It was a very cool idea, but they were not particularly uh, you know, widely used. The first big success for CNNs was uh, uh, Jan Lecun's MNIST classifier, which we saw the example, we saw the video a long time ago, right? Which was used to recognize handwritten, handwritten digits. Uh, some uh, details of his final classifier. But then there was this big hiatus where not a lot happened until people began looking at ImageNet. Now the ImageNet is a large scale visual recognition challenge. This data were collected by folks at Stanford. The actual data set has, set has millions of images and thousands of categories. And the typical evaluations people ran on where it was where they had 1.2 million images to train on and they had to distinguish between about 1,000 categories of uh, image classes. And performance was pretty bad for a while. If you were looking at the top five, well, how frequently did the class you, uh, the true class of the uh, image, appear in the top five classes chosen by the classifier? That number used to range from 25% to 50%, meaning half the time, the class you chose wouldn't even be in the top five. or a, or a quarter of the time, it wouldn't even be in the top five. And then along came AlexNet. This was uh, uh, in 2012, where they first introduced a very large CNN. The la and CNN was so large that they couldn't even publish the picture of the CNN. So this is actually from their paper. The upper portion of the picture gets cut off. Right? They had to distribute the CNN over two GPUs of, of the day. And perform their training. So this one contained 60 million parameters, 650,000 neurons. It was considered very large for the day. These days, it's a tiny thing. You, you train it on your laptop. Uh, five convolution layers, some of, them, some of which were where, followed by max pooling layers and three fully connected layers. They had a bunch of other things, engineering things they threw in. So here are the details of their uh, network, fairly complex. And then they added one interesting thing. So here's the number of uh, uh, details of the network, 650,000 neurons, 60 million parameters, and 630 million connections in the network, right? Uh, so this, finally, when they actually performed classification of an image, they didn't just classify the entire image. They cropped out random sections of the image and classified the same image many times with different, from different sections and then voted across the lot to get the best result. But here is the bottom line, that the error went down from what used to be 25% to 18.2% if they used a single net. If they used an ensemble of uh, seven nets, the error went down to 15.4%. So basically, they chopped 40%, the error down by 40% in one fell swoop. And this is where CNNs really took off, right? So uh, this, is the, this is from their paper again. You can see that the kind of uh, filters that they found in the lowest layer of their network look, look once again like the kinds of things we, we just saw. But what they found even more uh, interestingly was that the CNN learned meaningful representations of the input. It automatically learned to figure out how to represent data in a, uh, in a sensible manner. So first, this picture to the left shows you typical classification in, uh, that they got. So this is a mite. It recognizes it as a mite, the container ship. This is a motor scooter, and it does recognize this leopard. 
And when it makes mistakes, the mistakes are also often kind of meaningful. So this is supposed to be a convert to a grill because there's a grill in front, but it recognizes it as a convertible, which is a reasonable thing to be doing, right? This is supposed to be a mushroom, and mushroom comes in at number two in its list. This, for some reason, is labeled as a cherry because there are cherries in the foreground, but the uh, CNN decided that this was a Dalmatian. Clearly, I don't, I don't fault it. I thought it was a Dalmatian too. Right? Uh, this is uh, called a Madagascar cat. It recognized it as a, squ as a squirrel monkey. Again, not a, not a tremendously, uh, you know, tremendous error. The best thing is here. Just before the classify, you get representations that, de that are derived from the network, right? And if you just compare, if you sort of cluster the data according to these representations, then they found that, the rep that by clustering them, uh, you can see that if you chose the feature that you got for one image, in this case a flower, and pick the other images for which the representations were, were very similar, they all ended up being flowers. Similarly, if they chose you, the chosen elephant, everything else ended up being an elephant. So it actually ends up learning meaningful representations. Anyway, we're out of time, uh, but there are a bunch of slides over here. And the summary of all of that is that once the AlexNet came out over just three years, the error went down from 18% down to 3.5%, and now it's somewhere around 1% or something of that kind. Right? So CNN's really uh, made the whole thing work. And they're also used for speech recognition. Anyway, we'll stop here. We're done with CNNs. I suggest yes, you take a look at the last few slides in the lecture, just for completeness sake. And I'll see you in the next class.